When I thought about what to prepare uh, and talk to you about this evening, I was quite frankly overwhelmed with ideas and points to make. There is so much history that hasn't been told from the Kumeyaay or California Indian perspective that Mike covered so well um, that it was hard to narrow the focus to one particular reading, analysis, or topic. Um, with that said, part of my struggle is in part due to the fact that I am not a historian. Rather, I study literature and issues of representation on identity and community formation. My approach to studying the past is through an analysis that considers how historical events, actions, and experiences shape our moment. In literature, this often leads to inquiries about identity, power, and agency, or the ability of a person to actively participate in the shaping and defining of that person's life. To understand the history, actions, and experiences that shape our present moment for California Indians, the focus requires a decolonized perspective like the history presented uh, by Mike. Um, so I should also say, too, um, I grew up reading uh, Harlequin romances, which were the books that my mom read. And uh, my dad had the full time life collection, I believe that was what it was, the like, it wasn't real leather, but it was sort of bound, of Louis L'Amour books. That, those are the only like novels in our household. We didn't have a library. We could get books from the bookmobile um, at school. Um, but I was an avid reader. I learned to read really young. And I remember <coughs> reading um, the first, I remember reading in my mind the first time, right, reading silently. And I thought it was magic. I thought it, like somehow I had this magical power um, because I could hear myself in, in my head and see the words on the page. And um, I think it was five, but I, I distinctly remember that. Um, and so I always wanted to read. I read whatever magazines we had, newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. So going into um, literature as my field of study, um, you know, was, was sort of a natural inclination for me. Um, but at the end of the day, as I started my formal education um, in college at Cal State San Marcos, not San Diego State. <laughs> well, it's really San Diego State North, right? Was how it was uh, developed. Um, I started to realize that all of the narratives that I was reading, um, you know, were obviously from England um, or from European countries, and then of course uh, the canon of American literature. Uh, and I just, you know, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I, I was identifying with women um, and their experiences and their roles, but they're all so different from me um, that I really didn't feel a connection uh, until I started to read uh, multicultural ethnic literature. And I probably read uh, Toni Morrison first. And, uh, and that was the connection for me. Um, the African uh, American woman's experience somehow resonated. Then I moved on to Chicano uh, and Chicano literature. And then finally, someone gave me a Sherman Alexie book. Um, so this is, you know, if you know Sherman Alexie, it's like the early 90s. And that for me sort of lit the real fire in me um, to look for American Indian representations in film beyond sort of The Last of the Mohicans um, and some of the, the representations that are in, um, you know, like Hawthorne and Poe, where we're just lurking in the shadows in the wilderness with our tomahawks, right? Because we don't have tomahawks out here in California, so uh, we have hampoos. <laughs> so, so that's sort of my journey into literary studies. Um, so the whole connection with decolonization, um, you know, of course, emerges out of like graduate work and um, advancing in my, in my studies. Um, but I read Ramona early on in my uh, graduate career. It was after I already finished at Cal State San Marcos, and it actually was the first time I had read it, even though the nearby town to Santa Isabel, where I'm from, is the town of Ramona. Uh -huh. And as you drive in from uh, Highway 78, um, coming down into Ramona, the valley, I was always told that the image of the horizon is a woman, and that was supposed to be Ramona. So then when I read the story, I was really confused because she was from LA and San Gabriel Mission, and then Alessandra was from Temecula. And so I was trying to piece together this narrative because it didn't fit, right? It didn't fit with what I knew and the places that I grew up in or the Ramona that I was ta told and um, taught about. And so that's a little bit of a digression, but let me scoot forward. Um, so back to decolonization, right? So I also had to decolonize the knowledge that I had learned, right, and, and decolonize um, the literature that I had been taught in order to start to um, think about really the place of women like me, California Indian women, um, and where we belong and where we fit in and where our stories are told. So Maori activist and scholar Linda Tuhui Smith writes, history is also about power. In fact, history is mostly about power. It is the story of the powerful and how they became powerful, and then how they use their power to keep them in positions in which they can continue to dominate others. It is because of this relationship with power that we have been excluded, 
marginalized, and othered. So Smith's work deconstructs history and colonial relationships through this method of decolonization. She reminds us that decolonizing history requires unsettling and reordering the narrative from an indigenous perspective to restory the land and restore the people. The question of where to begin this process to address the fabrication of a mythical past about California, the first people, and Euro-American settlers is for me an issue that requires a serious inquiry about the invisibility of California Indian women, their lives, struggles, resistance, and ultimately their survival. The representation of California Indian women through the story of Ramona, the slide that I had up earlier, is arguably the most detrimental, misrepresented, and most appropriated stereotype. The cultural and social contributions of California Indian women, who are now well known for their knowledge <coughs> of and contributions to ethnobotany, remain highly invisible in mainstream history and educational curricula. The erasure and absence of their presence belies the impact of their lives and roles in their communities. So that's sort of the core of like my ongoing research and publications one day, um, is to bring more of those stories of actual people from our communities to the forefront. Um, but for me, um, the text that really uh, inspires my work and inspired this, this line of inquiry is the autobiography of Delfina Cuero. Um, so the voice that I hear most frequently is that of Delfina, and I know it's as told through Florence Schipek in this little compact ethnography. If you haven't read Florence Schipek's um, narrative about Delfina's life, then you need to go home and order it tonight or go to KCC and buy it from, <laughs> from the Kumeyaay, uh, Cultural, or Kumeyaay Community College. And you need to read it next week. It's really short. You could probably read it in a couple hours. I believe it should be required reading for all residents of San Diego County. I teach it in almost every one of my classes or, or parts of it. This compact book provides insights and stories about the radical transformation and impact of American settler colonialism on, uh, on Kumeyaay people through a testimonial format. Shipek centers Cuero's narrative as both wit witness to and survivor of what Benjamin Madley describes as, quote, the California Indian catastrophe and genocide. To begin to decolonize the myth of California, it is necessary to read these stories and fabrications against the grain of the lived reality of California Indians. And for me, Cuero's book and other literary scholars and historians, you know, may find ethnographies, especially as told to ethnographies, problematic. I know Richard Carrico was here, and he's done a ton of research um, and talks about Delfina Cuero's life and, and um, educates the community about the knowledge that she shared and passed on. Um, so for me, I think that um, Shipek was really ahead of her time uh, in terms of doing this work in the 1950s and 60s and then finally, you know, publishing what she did in the 70s and 80s. She really was uh, a, what we would call like a participatory research researcher. Um, she, she didn't just go into the community and um, sort of hold the subjective distance position. She really, um, you know, became a part of the community and she worked very hard to present the issues that the um, Kumeyaay, Luceno, um, Cupeño people were experiencing and bring it to the forefront of our region and our state and really the nation. Um, so when you read the book, you can decide for yourself whose voice is authoritative in the text and, and, and whose isn't. So to that end, I, or I ended up organizing my talk based on a strategy following uh, Anton Truer's Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask, <laughs> and Roxanne dunbar Ortiz and uh, Dina um, Gilia Whitaker's All the Real Indians Died Off and 20 Myths About American Indians. Um, so both of their texts are very uh, approachable, so if you haven't read these, they're just good ways to pick up information and dispel stereotypes and misconceptions about American Indian people. Um, a lot of them, again, are, th these texts are filling in the narrative, you know, just that um, in terms of the way Mike had framed it. Um, so following their footsteps, if you will. My goal is to help you reconsider some of the mythology of California Indians, primarily represented in Helen Hunt's Jackson story of Ramona, the impact on California Indian women specifically, and the false history that the literature uh, perpetuates. Okay, so um, 
I couldn't even come up with like a super clever title. I mean, I tried to distill it down for you, um, but because I, I kept coming up with all of these uh, different connections. So then I was going to have ten myths, and I thought, oh, that's kind of a lot. And so then I thought, okay, I'll try to shrink it down into five and collapse them. Um, so there are myths about California Indians, sort of according to this, you know, what's presented in Ramona. And this isn't super original research. If you if you've studied her story at all, and even uh, what Mike is sharing. Um, you know, it's so popularized and it gets recycled and reproduced. And, and I think now people don't even realize, like, you know, the full origin story of her narrative. Um, but I really think that it also signals some limits of the romance genre, and in particular, this little niche genre of the Indian love story and what can actually be accomplished. And especially if you look at it from the Indian woman's point of view, we're definitely um, not uh, portrayed. Uh, accurately and we don't always get happy endings that people associate with uh, American romances. Uh, <clears throat> so in order um, to deconstruct the myths about California Indians and Ramona, we first have to understand the creation of the many deep and abiding images and fantasies that circulate about American Indians and discern how California Indian representations are further distorted. Two of the best-selling Indian romances were published in the 19th century, both authored by uh, white women, and they featured tragic love stories about endearing native women. The nagging Indian question that challenged the settlers um, in this time period was answered with the institutionalization of bureaucratic policies to forcibly incorporate America's first peoples into the national body politic or to eradicate them entirely. And both of these texts sort of deal with that um, those, those encounters between settlers and the indigenous people that they inevi <coughs> inevitably encountered as they made their foray into the wilderness. These two late 19th century sentimental novels dramatize these national issues of American Indian conflicts. Anne S. Stevens' uh, story, Mylaska, the Indian Wife of the White Hunter, um, was published in 1860, and Jackson's novel, of course, was published in 1884. So Maleska was written as part of a serial publication in a women's magazine in 1861, and it became an instant classic. So again, um, this is sort of the precursor to the dime novel, and actually um, Maleska becomes one of the first dime novels that Beadle and Company ever published. Um, and it was so popular, you know, that it sort of um, became the template for all these other dime novels, um, dime novel westerns, etc. Um, so although Maleska is set in the 18th century near New England in New England. Um, a whole century before American settlement in California and the West, the same colonial narrative about American settlers versus indigenous occupiers um, occurs in both stories. In Maleska's case, it's an episodic and tragic romance. Um, she is what the title suggests, the Indian wife of the white hunter. Um, they sort of have this idyllic, isolated romance and affair. Uh, they're married in the Indian sense that she you know, accepts his courtship and the, the tribe, you know, sanctified it. So they're living together, they have a child, and they're welcoming him into the community. Um, but he sort of goes back and forth between the tribal community and the colony. And eventually there's an accident, it's, it's unfortunate, you know, this is a romance, it was, it was an accident. Someone gets shot on a hunting trip and of course it creates an uprising um, of the colonists because they believe that it was an attack by the Indians. And so a war breaks out. Um, in the story, uh, the hunter, <laughs> Danforth, is, um, he's wounded mortally and after he wounds, you know, an Indian and it turns out it's the chief you know, and of course his wife is the daughter of the chief, so they both die. And so this causes like an even bigger conundrum because now Maleska is really torn, like her husband killed her dad and her dad killed her husband, and so she's trying to like mend the feud, but instead everybody's pissed off at her and they kick her out of the tribe, they exile her, which is like a fate worse than death if you're in the native community. Um, she seeks shelter with her husband's family in New York, and um, they do not want anything to do with her. They cannot believe that her son would degrade himself and bed in, you know, an Indian S word, right? And so what they do <coughs> instead is accept the child, the mixed um, blood child, into their home 
and agree to let her stay on as the nanny, essentially, as the domestic servant. So she spends her whole life suppressing the fact that she's this child's mother. She can't reveal herself or they will exile her too. And she really doesn't have anywhere else to go. So she has to make some sacrifices and choices. Um, so that story kind of sets up this motif in the romance genre and a lot of other tropes. I think you can probably think about Western stories that have similar um, themes or similar scenes where the Indian woman is always sort of faced with these impossible decisions, right? Um, is, you know, can she be allowed to have desire for somebody, right? Um, is she going to be punished for that? Um, is she going to lose her children, right? Does she have to sacrifice her community identity and affiliation in order to be, quote unquote, like a good mother? Um, or does she abandon her children, right? So all of these complex intersecting choices that get set up. Ramona is different. It is a different story. How many of you have read Ramona? All right, a good portion of you. Have you seen a film of Ramona or the Ramona pageant by chance? Okay, so you're a little bit familiar with the narrative. Um, all right, so my point is that the imposition of European attitudes and beliefs about gender, race, and then gender roles um, have, indel have indelibly skewed historical representations of Native women. In most instances, American Indian women are burdened by the image of what Raina Green in 1975 famously described as the Pocahontas Perplex, in which Native female representation is paradoxically captured between the image of the Indian princess savior or the figure of the Indian woman as the S word, starts with S, ends with W, um, who embodies the projection of European um, uh, psychosexuality that is at once desirable, like wild and exotic, and yet threatening, dark, savage, and inscrutable. Um, both novels struggle and fail to resolve this Pocahontas perplex for their um, eponymous heroines. Maleska ends up, as I said, as a social outcast, exiled from her tribe and shunned by the white dominant society. She, is, she becomes the paradigm for the poverty-stricken, childless um, old Indian woman living at the edge of civilization. Jackson's attempt to validate and empower Ramona through her knowledge about uh, the revelation of her indigenous ancestry ultimately backfires in the narrative, and I'm gonna get into that in a minute. Um, so the plot fails in my mind to imagine a world in which an Indian woman can be independent or free, although Jackson set out, as Mike earlier said, to, to write a fictional um, novel that would actually bring awareness to um, the plight of California Indians and what was actually happening here, right? To stop the genocide, stop the dispossession and disenfranchisement. Um, so she thought, if I can only sort of appeal to their sentimentality, to their morals, to their ethical values, to their Christian values, um, it might be able to mobilize like social and political change. But that just doesn't ever happen. So in Ramona, Jackson utilized her firsthand accounts and knowledge as a special agent for the Commission of Indian Affairs to provide this compelling evidence that she thought was gonna elicit support for her Indian cause. Um, her experiences as an Indian agent um, inspired um, the template and format for the novel. And ultimately, she hoped that the reformation of Indian policies that were tearing apart uh, California natives uh, would end. Unfortunately, her text fell short in accomplishing such a lofty social goal and instead, as, as, as Mike already said, her pastoral novel sows the seeds of an idyllic land open for settlement, right? It becomes the advertisement, it becomes the draw, it becomes the reason people want to come to California and settle. So Jackson's story of Ramona um, is a sentimental romance. It opens with this really beautiful description of a rancho um, in which um, Senora Moreno is um, sort of looking out across the vast, beautiful open space of her ranch and debating, you know, uh, her worries about managing the property. Um, you have images of, um, of uh, the California staff, um, this young maiden, um, the dog captain, um, just sort of all kind of, you can almost hear the birds chirping as you're reading the opening pages, if you've ever read it. Go back and read it, you can look it up too online. Um, so it really is the scene of like calm, repose. If you have any sort of imaginations of like wide open spaces in California, you can insert those there. Um, Ramona um, is the, the niece, right, the ward of Senora Moreno, this ruling aristocratic sort of California woman. Um, 
she doesn't have a good relationship with her aunt. She's, she's, she's fearful of her and uh, for good reason. Her aunt's sort of vengeful and, and very strict about her, her belief system. Um, as the novel progresses, R Ramona takes interest in one of the sheep shearers that arrive from Temecula, and it's Alessandro the, the Indian. She's attracted to him, he's attracted to her, they're kind of noticing each other, it's sort of like the star-crossed lover motif. Um, eventually, um, their, their passions, right? They, they confess their love and confess their, their passion for one another, but they're like, oh, it can never be, because Alessandro is the poor Indian from Temecula, and Ramona is the niece or relative of, of the Morenos. Um, as the story goes on, it is revealed that Ramona is in fact half Indian, right? She actually is not of, uh, she's not a Californio, she's not a uh, Mexican, um, uh, she, she is part um, Indian. So that sort of allows for this union to take place sort of temporarily in Jackson's, in Jackson's story. And the rest of the narrative is about the two of them running away to get married. She refuses um, to stay with her, her aunt. And they're sort of chased about, right? They're, they, um, they appeal to the priest, Father Salva Salvadora, Salvadera? Salvadera, I'm saying it incorrectly, um, for sanctuary. So they, they run off and they get married, which is why there's all these places that you can go see where they got married, where they slept, um, you know, all of that, <laughs> all of the little tourist industry that's built up around this, this fantasy. Um, the narrative devolves pretty quickly once they sort of leave the idyllic space, the, the Garden of Eden, if you will, right? That is the Moreno Rancho. And um, suddenly sort of the outside forces that are really actually um, circulating in, in the state at the time start to impact their life. Everywhere they stop to settle, they're kicked off the property. Um, and they're just pushed further and further into what Shipex would say, or Florence Shipex would say, they're pushed into the rocks, right? They finally end up at the San Jacinto Mountain, thinking that they can have refuge, they can raise their children, um, but that also doesn't work out. Um, so spoiler alert, uh, Alessandro gets killed, um, Ramona gets rescued by her cousin, sort of love interest on the Moreno side, goes back home with him, and they're both deported. They essentially decide, this is after the Secularization Act, um, yeah, that uh, it's safer for them to go back to Mexico City because things in California are just getting too crazy and, um, and it, it would be easier for them. So Ramona makes the choice of sparing her daughter the burden of race um, by choosing to go back to Mexico. So she uh, disavows her Indian ancestry um, doesn't ever make it back to the San Gabriel mission to try to find her mother or reunite, um, which would make her actually um, most likely Tongva. I guess she could possibly be Chumash or maybe even Tatavayam. Those are some of the, in, um, could be a Hachiman too. She could be a Hachiman. Um, but she doesn't make that effort. And Jackson doesn't even imagine that for her. Instead, she sends them back. So you could see why people that were reading this text in the East Coast would think California is open for settlement. You know, this tragic story happens, but now they're all gone, right? The Californios are gone, you know, the Mexicans are conquered because the U.S. wins the war, and the Indians are gone too, because they either went to Mexico or they're pushed into the rocks somewhere. Um, so, so it makes perfect sense if you look at it only in a literary sense. Jackson's novel in the, in the end deports both Ramona and Felipe, and of course Alessandro's already dead, um, and so they're effectively dispossessed and disenfranchised both in the, the narrative and outside, right, by American laws that would deny them citizenship, land, ownership, and basic human rights. The novel's sympathetic appeal to its readers on behalf of California's mission Indians is ineffectual precisely because at the novel's end, Jats Jackson makes it too easy uh, for readers to imagine California without um, Indians or Mexicans. She reifies the text's latent ideology of manifest destiny by suggesting with the representation of Alessandro's um, descent into madness and his eventual murder that California Indians are unfit to occupy and control the Edenic lands that she so vividly describes in the novel. If we read the ending of Jackson's novel as a prediction for the future, there would be no Indians or Mexicans in California today. For as much as Jackson set out to write a romance that appealed to the sentimentality of her readers to mobilize sympathy for the Indian cause, um, Jackson instead further romanticized the people of the region and the history of war and conquest that caused the Indian problem in the first place. Okay, so 
that sets me up for Delfina Cuero. The story of Delfina Cuero is, is a story of Cuero recounting her life um, growing up being born in, uh, in or near Hamashaw, which is near El Cajon, uh, and being continuously pushed off of their lands for all of the reasons that Mike already talked about, the vagrancy laws. Uh, Cuero was born, I think Shipek estimated around 1900, and Richard could correct me if I'm off, so the turn of the century, roughly, and she recounts her story of just as a child sort of having um, pleasant memories um, even though they were always on the move and they would have to often pick up and leave it sounds like in the narrative at a moment's notice um, she recounts um, you know playing games um, making mud dolls um, sliding on rocks until she ruined her backside um, just things that kids would do um, and, and the impetus behind Shipbeck sort of uh, documenting this narrative account of Cuero um, came in part because Shipbeck was commissioned, and also she was a, a researcher and a scholar, but she was commissioned to sort of find out were there any existing um, uh, peoples that had originally lived along San Diego's coastline. Like where were those Indians at? Did they, go, did they get relocated to the mountain tribes or to the inland tribes and put on reservations? Are they still living in those areas? Um, she, was, she was documenting um, if she could find any. Uh, so I put myth number one that the, the, the issue of converted to Catholicism. I mean, I could have made up, a, like I said, 10, 15, 20 um, different myths that are in the story, but I was trying to, to condense it. And to go with this, this idea of the fabrication of this California creation myth, and as it pertains to the missionization of California Indians, this is still a question that I get all the time from my students. Um, that, you know, are you Catholic, right? Did, did, you, did you go to, mission, to the mission, you know, are all Indians Catholic? Um, and so in Cuero's book, just to use it as an example, to answer this um, and subvert it, I think, um, she herself, um, born in Hamishaw, I think was baptized, but the, the church burns down, um, which sets up this conundrum for um, Cuero, which Shipek is actually helping her to resolve or tried to help her resolve, is that she doesn't have record of her birth. She doesn't have a baptismal record. She doesn't have any other kind of record. Um, and so she can't prove that she was born on this side of the border, right? So she's born in the turn of the century. Um, she, at the time that Cuero finds her, is living in Campo, but she really was living in uh, one of the ejidos um, across the border um, and didn't have status as being American Indian, although she was born here, um, and she is Kumiai. Um, so her story is a lot like other um, indigenous communities that, you know, the international borders, borders cross them, cross their uh, ancestral territories, um, the Odom people, um, um, the Haudenosaunee and the Akwesasne in New York, um, and there are others. Uh, so she's, she lacks this citizenship. She has relatives in Campo and in the San Diego region, and she wants to come back. So that's sort of the back story of her, um, her ethnography. So these are my examples of sort of how her narrative kind of counters this myth. Um, she doesn't ever say that she met a priest. If she was baptized as a child or a baby, um, you know, she, she doesn't remember it. Um, so she says, my grandmother told me that she was under the priest at the mission for a little while. The Indians around Ha'a and Nehi talked about the ones that used to be down there. The Indians did not like them because they had to work too hard for the priests. They wove blankets and bedding, made oyas, and learned how to make mud houses. The Indians either learned and did it, or they were punished. They said the priests were all bad because they made uh, the Indians work. And she says, I heard, I heard about the priests. I never saw one. She never baptized her children. She just went ahead and did it, gave them names like the other Indians. Um, so my point here is that um, there wasn't sort of this blind capitulation to Catholicism. Even in, you know, 1900 um, and into the 20th century, um, there was still, you know, you could call it resistance, but still sort of doing stuff the way that um, Kumeyaay people had been doing it for, for years before that, right, for centuries before that. She, she lived away from the mission, so she didn't need to follow their rules. Um, and what she did learn of them, she, she figured they were bad. She was going to stay away. All right. So myth number two. California Indians lacked intelligence and were, quote, unquote, lazy diggers. So I really do not like the digger word. 
for California Indians because, A, I think it's really ironic because Americans came here to dig for gold, right? So who were the real diggers? They were digging for something that couldn't sustain them or feed them or help their community. Um, so it just sort of shows the difference in values and worldviews. Um, but here are just some quotes um, that sort of highlight that the Kumeyaay already had a cosmology, which you can read Mike's book too. <laughs> so, grandfather knew all the songs that went with the death ceremonies and the image. He was important because he knew all of these songs. So these songs were bird songs that you know uh, Rao was talking about, and our death ceremony and those songs have been passed down as part of our original creation story. Um, and so I'm told by Stan Rodriguez, one of my cultural mentors, that it takes four days to tell the whole sequence of that, those creation stories. And so how death comes into the world, you know, it's part of that balance and understanding of the great mysteries of life. There's always life and there's always death. And how you learn to cope with that in the in-between is sort of what a lot of our origin stories and cosmologies are about. Um, so these are just other examples. Um, the old men used to preach to the boys. They told the boys how to live. The girls were taught these things and how to be cleaned by their grandmothers. They had rules for the children about how to behave. Um, she says, my grandmother told me about what they did um, to the girls when they were about to become women. So she's talking about puberty ceremonies and she's demonstrating that there was intergenerational teaching, right? She was demonstrating that certain people um, were respected and, and valued in the community because they knew the history of these things and they knew these practices. And that's really similar to how, um, how some of the roles are today. Um, she talks about the fact that her husband, Sebastian Osun, um, went through a boy ceremony um, and that the, you know, this, this was something that was um, uh, planned and there was a special place where they taught the boys how to be good men. Um, and so this revitalization of some of the puberty ceremonies is sort of happening today. Um, uh, but it's a practice that across California, across um, the country, is definitely being restored, right? Looking to our stories and looking to um, our traditional philosophies, not just about how to take care of the land, but how to take care of the people, how to take care of yourself. Those stories are coming back. Um, the more we get um, language speakers, bird singers, bird dancers, historians, um, and educate not only our outside communities, but ourselves, um, we can revitalize these practices. And so the significance of the oral tradition is highlighted by the last bullet point that many stories were told all the time. The stories used to tell how people are and what to expect from other people in the way of behavior. Um, and so I always explain that to my students as, you know, it's how to be and how to have in the world. It's not that complicated to think about, but it's the relationship that's so um, important between both concepts. So myth number three, California Indians didn't live on the coastline, so ship X work definitely refutes that. The coastline was just the first contact. Those um, tribal communities or tribal nations that were there um, were sort of um, the front line, right? And if they were defeated um, through um, assaults or through pandemic, which did happen, um, you know, mostly they kept getting pushed further and further away. Um, um, so Cuero's narrative provides vivid and accurate details about places that she lived and gathered um, throughout San Diego and Baja California, especially including the coastal areas of the region. So if you've ever been to Torrey Pines, which many of you probably have, there's a plaque there. Um, and the picture actually that I had at the beginning was Delfina Cuero. Um, that's her visit to Torrey Pines State Park with Florence Shipbeck and uh, Margaret Langdon, who was the linguist that developed the orthography for um, one of our Kumeyaay dictionaries. Um, so her knowledge is still a part of San Diego today. Um, it still gets um, um, put out if you go to local, um, the um, San Diego parks um, and the state parks, um, you can do Quero walks. I know Richard's um, organized those, so you can look for those and sort of really see the landscape through her eyes if you read the narrative. California Indian women were not good mothers. So this is, um, and they were docile and subservient. So this is like a real stickler for me um, because there is so much um, baggage from these, these narratives that really did impact our communities. Um, and we're still coming out of it. You know, that intergenerational trauma that Mike mentioned at the end is very real, and other communities have it too. Any community that's gone through a devastating 
um, event on sort of a, a, a wide social scale will have people that are impacted psychologically and emotionally and even physically from, from those events. So intergenerational trauma is not exclusive to American Indian people, um, but it's definitely, um, it names, uh, gives a name to sort of the symptoms and um, uh, cycles of, you know, it can be dysfunction or um, depression um, or low self-esteem or all of those issues that can accompany um, a traumatic event. So for me, the narratives constructed according to white colonial logic imagine the destruction of the Native American woman, her role as a cultural bearer, bearer and a mother. I read this type of literary representation as another form of violence against indigenous women. Um, and then her offspring also become targets of ethnic cleansing and genocide um, through the, through the um, state-sponsored educational system, state-sanctioned state policies of indentured labor and outright murderous assaults. So the erasure through the historical denial of native motherhood in histories and literature um, is a national fantasy intended to assuage and to acquit settlers of the colonial violence and genocide perpetrated on um, native people. The fiction flies in the face of reality in literary accounts of survival and the struggle of indigenous women to maintain their families and adapt their parenting skills under the threat of colonization. In Cuero's story, her entire life is explained through her role as a woman, wife, mother, um, and the sacrifices she makes to care for her children under extraordinary circumstances. Indeed, her motivation for telling her story was in the hope that it would serve as a testimony to validate her birthright as a Kumeyaay from Mission Valley and allow her and her children to be enrolled um, or have status in San Diego. Her actions are expressly different from those that Jackson imagines for Ramona. In the novel, Ramona never knows her Indian mother, um, the Tongva woman from San Gabriel Mission. She does not learn her role as a Payam Kawicham wife or daughter-in-law and chooses instead to leave right, her homeland, her husband's tribe, in order to spare her daughter what she sees as being a burden, her, her, Indian, her mixed blood Indian ancestry, perpetuating the fiction that Indian women are docile, subservient, and do not stand and fight for their survival. So these are just quotes from Quero, and there's, there's much more intense experiences that she goes through, but if you haven't read it, I don't wanna give it all away, but just trigger warning, there's really, um, she makes some really tough decisions in her life, um, and she talks about those, about what she has to do to keep her family together, and how she has to care, care for her children. So myth number five. Although Helen Hunt Jackson was a self-proclaimed friend to the Indians and worked as the special agent for the superintendent of Indian affairs, her novel, uh, perhaps more than any other, failed, as this, as, uh, failed to mobilize that public support for policy change. Jackson attempts to revise the genre to include the experiences of an Indian woman's desire to escape the limitations of her prescribed race, but she doesn't quite achieve this desired um, outcome. Praised by many critics for its tender love story, it fails to provide the desired effect um, to actually create reform. And Valerie Shearer Mathis quotes Jackson as saying, after she she realizes she, she hasn't done anything. I am sick at heart and discouraged. I see nothing more I can do or write. And, um, and I say, thank God she didn't write anymore because who knows what would have happened. Thank my aha, that's what I should have said. <laughs> uh, so, so I put here um, that as myth number five, California Indians disappear at the end of the 19th century for the obvious reason that we didn't disappear. And this is, these are statistics for um, the nation, um, but you know, you could see that I put this bullet here based on 2010 um, census data for population growth projections. Um, it's estimated by the, by the bean counters that do all this work. Um, and the census is problematic too, but that there will be a 2.7% increase of American Indian Alaska natives um, by 2016, um, or approximately 11.2 million. So up from, right, 5.2, that's a lot. Um, so is it because people are like mass producing native people? Um, or is it that more and more people are acknowledging that they actually do have this ancestry and trying to find their way back to their roots, right? So some of this, it, it is incredibly problematic and it is another paper um, to talk about American Indian identity and who can claim it and who can't and issues of authenticity and membership, especially around gaming, <laughs> for gaming tribes. Um, but, you know, it's, it sort of opens your eyes up to the, to the fact that there is a shift, I think, around the way people perceive and think about um, American Indian people, their history, and their survival, right, today. 
So for Quero, when you read her text, um, there's a little afterward. She ended up living out her life on the Campo Indian Reservation, getting a little pension, um, but she, she passed away. Um, um, but she was surrounded by friends and extended family, and her, descendant, her descendants still live on in Baja today. Um, so my future work is to, um, to document their stories um, and hopefully give back to them in some way um, because they don't have the same status um, as, as we do here in the, in the States. Um, so that would be um, the work that I'm trying to do. So here's my conclusion. In uh, 1969, um, in the midst of American Indian activism and mobilization for treaty reparations and human rights, Vine Deloria Jr. wrote that the ideological leverage is always superior to violence. The problems of Indians have always been ideological rather than social, political, or economic. It is vitally important that the Indian people pick the intellectual arena as the one in which to wage war. Today, American Indian Studies scholars have written extensively about the need to degender colonial, uh, de -gender colonial stereotypes about American Indian women, which create the mythology that our grandmothers and aunties <coughs> lacked agency and power and passively experienced colonization. Choctaw historian Devin Mihisua reminds us of the significance of these studies to redress um, this violence and disempowerment. She writes, colonialism, a powerful force, continues to affect indigenous females in countless ways. Uh, end quote. It is high and well past the time to paraphrase Raina Green that the Pocahontas perplex be laid to rest and the native woman be defined as Indian in Indian terms. Otherwise, these stories will remain devoid of native voices as Mehisua laments and remain therefore only partial histories. So mapping uh, the individual struggle for indigenous women's survivance is the focus of more recent scholarly productions and one that I hope to enter into the field of that take into account an, an investigation by American Indian Studies scholars of gender relations in their own nations. These studies provide a place-based and tribally specific lens to disaggregate indigenous women's experiences and articulations of subjectivity. Audra Simpson's Mohawk Interruptus, Michelle Jacobs' Yakima Rising, and Kuchibaldi Rinsling's We Are Dancing For You, which is forthcoming this year, provide complex intersectional case studies about what it means to be a Haudenosaunee, Yakima, Hoopa, Karak, Yurok woman and scholar by examining the cultural, historical, and contemporary roles, expectations, and contributions of women in their respective tribes. The impact of the growing body of research produced by indigenous women reveals the heterogeneity of experiences as well as the unique construction and negotiation of their female identities and the significant contributions made by American Indians to the field of history. Thus, it, it is even more apparent that the need to raise our voices and share the experiences of California's indigenous women as a vital component to decolonization, uh, to decolonize and restore our tribal nations. The contemporary issues challenging natives in San Diego are direct outgrowths of the root problems our ancestors personally faced 100, 200, and 500 years ago. So for me, this coalesced this week around the super blue blood moon, which came about in 1866. And I was thinking about this talk, and I was thinking about Quero, and I was thinking about my own family. And I was thinking, like, our ancestors looked at that moon and how different it was, right? Places in San Diego looking up at that. If you just think back, it doesn't feel that long ago, but yet, you know, we haven't come that far in some regards. So. Um, just, I don't know, just thoughts for you to, to consider. So my attempt to debunk some of the mythology of California history and our indigenous place um, in it um, through Delfina Cuero's story, which I know was abridged, um, <laughs> I hope it opens up the space for what Linda Tahui Smith um, um, describes as a dialogue across the boundaries of oppositions. It is possible. She explains us the that the conversation has to be because we constantly collide with dominant views while we are attempting to transform our lives on a larger, larger scale than our own localized circumstances. I teach my students that stories, words, and language create meanings in our lives, whether we are writing, singing, or speaking. It is the interpretation of those words, the discourse and dialogue we enter into with those words, that begins to shift, recover, and recreate the language systems necessary to carve out space, meaning, location for our Indian selves and voices to be seen and heard in new and transformative ways. Okay.